Welcome back, fans of sensory analysis. So we are on to the last module that we're going to be doing for the uh, sensory analysis class at Niagara College. And we have been working on quantitative descriptive analysis testing. And this is a more complicated method. And I realized that um, in sensory analysis, there's even more complicated methods than this. And the way I'm presenting um, descriptive analysis is somewhat simplified from how it how it can be done and could be done. But uh, again, I, I remind folks that I'm doing these uh, side presentations for an introductory course in sensory analysis. And there's so much more to study and I highly encourage people to go and look up more resources. But uh, this is the last module that we'll be doing for the sensory analysis course at Niagara College. And so let's just jump right in here. Uh, so this is a multi-part video, and, and actually it's funny because I have some of the other parts and I had done them before. And so this part one video is going to link out to some part two and part three videos um, where I do some data analysis and, and talk about data collection and some of the statistics behind this. But I realized that uh, the introduction work that I did in the previous round with, with COVID just hitting at the time, um, it wasn't of the quality that I wanted, so I wanted to make a new video. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to define the role of QDA. When we say QDA, quantitative descriptive analysis, we'll talk about this style of testing in product development processes. We'll define the correct hypothesis testing for QDA and structure questions appropriately for the hypothesis. We'll know the phases of development for a basic QDA sensory setup, including attribute development, development of a scoring method, training for the attributes, and then running the analysis. We'll review the tray setup, labeling and questionnaire scorecard. We'll read the scorecard and interpret individual results. And we'll do some basic interpretation of QDA scores to make formulation recommendations. And again, as I mentioned, there's going to be a part two and part three on this video um, where I walk you through doing more of the statistics because again, um, this method is more complicated, but at the same time, I think it's well within your capabilities with some basic ANOVA basic Tukey's post hoc and basic um, basic data uh, management within a spreadsheet. So why would we be doing descriptive analysis? Well, in essence, we've, we've done a few other methods where we've done description. Think of the check all that apply. We have listed out all these different attributes and we've said, is this attribute in this product? Yes or no. Now we, and then we jump forward into doing hedonistic uh, work with attributes. And so we'd say, is this attribute in the product? Yes or no? How uh, how much is it, uh, or how much do you like it? I dislike it extremely, I dislike it slightly. And then we also did just about right. I would like, or I think there's too little of this attribute. I think it's just about right. Or I think there's too much of this attribute. Now we are putting the attributes on a linear continuum. And what that means is that we're putting it on a line scale. And well, it'll become evident what that line scale looks like in a minute, but then we can compare those line scales and those line scales we can convert into numerical values. And then we can convert those observations into, into numbers so we can do stats on them. And that's really what we're doing with, with descriptive analysis and quantitative descriptive analysis in particular. So again, I know you're gonna say this, this sounds repetitive, but I use the same structured slideshow every time because that way um, the, the students in Niagara College get used to those patterns and are able to pick up very quickly where they're at. So the basic question is, how does a panelist feel about the concentration or quantity of an attribute in the prototype product? And you're evaluating the population-based response based on a linear scale from very low level of an attribute to very high level of an attribute. And you can then do some analysis to say, are these attributes the same product to product? or are these attributes different product to product? But um, we're gonna be doing that using an ANOVA type analysis or a uh, t-test type analysis if we've only got two samples. So our basic setup, we've got 50, 10 to 15 panelists and we go with 15 quite frequently because let's say someone's sick one day or someone just can't make the appointment for the sensory analysis 
10 is sort of that baseline minimum that you really need um, 10 panelists to be able to have statistical relevance on your sampling. The panelists obviously are going to be screened for their ability to differentiate. Do they have colds, allergies, etc.? The advantage of doing uh, QDA is that it's got excellent ability to map population response. I realize that the the um, the population is very small, but you'll see in a moment that we do extensive training with that population to be able to discriminate the different attributes within the product. Limitation is that it's very complicated compared to doing just about right testing. If you're a product developer and you don't have to benchmark your sample, you just need to prove that it's delicious. Just about right is way easier and it's way cheaper to perform. Whereas if you need to be able to statistically benchmark and show how your product is performing against uh, or, or compared to other products, whether that's within your own product range, maybe you're doing a changeover uh, on a manufacturing facility and you need to benchmark the different attributes for, on that changeover. Um, maybe you're doing uh, a knockoff product where you are the, the uh, private label brand and you are trying to make a knockoff of a uh, existing national brand that doesn't have any intellectual property on it. And then you know that you're benchmarking against each of those attributes and that it's statistically identical. So it's far, it's far more complex. It, oops, pardon me. It does take a lot of training, both from the team who is organizing and uh, executing the sensory analysis, as well as from the participants. Those um, participants have to be well-trained doesn't tell you anything about how much people like it. And it's very centered on those attributes. And so as such, it's um, not going to give you a generalized opinion. Do you enjoy this? Do you not enjoy this? I think of one uh, product that we did years ago when I was uh, in graduate school at Iowa State University. And this was with Ken Prusha, who is a sensory analysis expert. And we had to do irradiated meat. And nobody liked the irradiated meat, but we needed to be able to benchmark those attributes and tell if different irradiation treatments cause sensory differences between the um, unirradiated versus minimally irradiated versus highly irradiated product. QDA works great with negative attributes. As a, you can guess, we were eating irradiated meat and it was not particularly tasty. And we were able to quite easily benchmark it, something that you can't do with just about right scoring. So why would a food science use it? Well, you can benchmark and statistically map those sensory attributes. And that statistics is really important. Just about right, there's an intuition aspect to it that if you're seeing that you're getting centralized tendency on that scoring, you say, you know what? People are enjoying this and they're feeling that this attribute is at the right level for this product and you move ahead. Whereas in the case of QDA, you're able to uh, do some statistical analysis um, in a much more straightforward way. It's usually used in early to mid-stage prototyping because um, you're often benchmarking. But that said, oftentimes it's used as well in quality assurance programs. And so, for example, I remember going and visiting um, the good folks at Sleeman Breweries. And they were doing, uh, this was years ago, but they were doing QDA on a routine basis with their employees. And they would bring in the team from finance and HR and accounting, and they would have to taste the beer on a routine basis to make sure that that beer was benchmarking against the, the standard formulation beer and that there was no defects or deviations in the, in the flavor profile prior to release of that product. So it can be used as, a, as part of a routine quality assurance program as well. And the nice thing about that is you've got the same employees and they get well trained and they're able to consistently participate because it's part of their work duty uh, to attend to the sensory analysis. So there are some steps. It's a, it's, it's a bit more complicated than a standard sensory analysis. So first off, you've got to figure out what the attributes are that are important for your survey. And this is actually done uh, once you've recruited the, the team that you're going to be working on. Yes, in your R&D team, in your sensory analysis team, the team that's executing this, this panel, you are going to identify the key attributes that you think are important but then you need to work with the participants to make sure that they understand the vocabulary and that they agree that those attributes are important. Oftentimes sensory analysis teams are part of uh, um, specialist groups or they're, they're well attuned with, with the product because they're, uh, 
they're experts in an organization that's making that product. And they may be able to pick up on defects that the general public can't pick up on. And so it's important to have consensus on those attributes. Then you're going to identify and define what a standard reference is on those attributes. And so you might find actual training samples that you can help figure out what those attribute, attributes might look like. You'll build out some 15 centimeter line scales, and we'll talk about the, the, the politics behind that. But in essence, once upon a time, we used to collect all this data on paper, and 15 centimeters fit really well on paper, and you could convert that to 150 millimeters. Nowadays, most people are doing it on computers, and you make a sliding line, uh, sliding line bar so that uh, you set it up so it has 150 uh, discrete points that you can uh, slide it on. You figure out where those reference standards are. If you've got reference standards, you're going to benchmark and say, we feel that this one is going to fit at the 100 millimeter mark or the 10 centimeter mark on the line. Um, you're going to train the panel and make sure that they've got good understanding, that they can identify those attributes and that they're repeatable on those attributes. When they start to have blinded samples, that they're able to repeatedly score on those attributes in the right range. Once you've got the good statistical relevance on your team, then you can run your study. And so you've got oftentimes many weeks, sometimes even many months of training and development before you can actually go about running these studies. And if you consider that, let's say you're compensating people for their time and you need them to show up over and over and over again, these can be very costly. Um, and so it's something to really be considerate about. So first off, as I mentioned, how are we collecting this data? First off, you're going to recruit your panel. And I realize there's not 10 to 15 people there, but that's my representative stock photo. And the facilitator is going to talk to them about what are those different attributes in the food product. That's our flavor wheel on the whiteboard. And the facilitator is going to um, discuss with the panelists to make sure that they understand what attributes they feel are important in the product and that they can discriminate what those attributes are and that the vocabulary makes sense that they're, that they're working with. From there, we're gonna start building out these 15 centimeter line scales. And I realize this is on your, yeah, your screen. And so the 15 centimeter line scale is really, it's really a, a concept now. It's not intended to be 15 centimeters on a piece of paper, but uh, on that line scale, I'm using peppers as an example. And here I've got images of a, a classic uh, red bell pepper that doesn't have a lot of heat. And I've got some cayenne pepper in the middle that has a reasonable amount of heat. And then I've got a uh, ghost pepper down here on the far end, which is one of the highest Scoville unit peppers out there and has an incredible amount of heat. And so if you think about where this needs to score, if you were to say, all right, folks, where is that bell pepper going to score? People would be going along with their slider bar and say, okay, the bell pepper is going to score there and the cayenne is going to score there on the line. And the ghost pepper should score, score there on the line because of the amount of heat. Now, going through that training, the thing is, it doesn't have to be those same extremes. Let's say you're doing, um, some of our friends at Vineland, Amy Bowen has been really helpful to me in the development of this course and um, has shared resources with uh, Niagara College in the past on sensory analysis. Well, those, those uh, brackets don't have to be extreme. So we could have a bell pepper and we could have a mild jalapeno here. And if, if, if our product doesn't, doesn't comprise peppers that have the heat of ghost peppers, we don't have to have that on our bracket. You can imagine if we had ghost peppers, but all our peppers were in the, the jalapeno to bell pepper range, all of our scores would be down in here and we would have a really difficult challenge with our statistics if that was the situation that we were in. And so you have to think about what's the uh, realistic range on those products and make sure that the brackets on that range are going to hit the, 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 the top theoretical level and the bottom theoretical level and not just go for the most extreme examples. Now, sometimes if you're developing a food product and it's important for you to understand what uh, the negative attributes are or the positive attributes are, you can make up 
uh, doctored samples. It doesn't have to be uh, something naturally occurring or something that you've bought at the grocery store or something you grew in your greenhouse. I uh, was working a project where we were working on apple cider and we actually, for uh, the purposes of training and doing some evaluation, we made up a fake apple cider where we had water, sugar, malic acid, and caramel color. And it looked like apple juice and it had some acidity and sugar in there that was roughly balanced to the apple juice. However, there was no apple flavor. And then in terms of our extreme on the same spectrum, we wanted to have apple juice, but we also added some natural apple flavor to over enhance the apple flavor so that our natural apple juices would be falling in the middle of the spectrum. And then we trained against those as our samples. I've, I remember that uh, some of my friends in the Brewmaster program are spiking beer samples. We did uh, QDA one time um, with beer samples and metallic was an important flavor. So we put a very small amount of ferrous sulfate, which is an iron uh, salt. It's a very common um, a nutritional fortificant. And so it's not unsafe to do that, but we put ferrous sulfate in the beer to give it a metallic flavor. And depending on the different types of attributes that you are doing, you can, you can make up or doctor up some different samples to get the attributes for training purposes. Oh, sometimes, sometimes when you're doing those trainings, you might actually give cues. And uh, so I, I did a, a sensory analysis at one point in time where we were evaluating um, the shelf life of spinach. And yes, we did do colorimetry where we were measuring with a color meter, the green color of the spinach. However, we wanted to see if the consumers were able to pick up on the discoloration. And so we did... Uh, some QDA work with uh, color spectrum. And so again, you have to think very deliberately what is the spectrum of possible colors that you might see. We've got some nice bright green fresh spinach down on the left hand side and we've got some um, yellow wilted um, almost rotting sort of spinach on the other side. You have to think about the responses that you're going to get. In, in the case of the green spinach, we would want to be seeing left-handed tendency in the data analysis. Sometimes you can link your attributes out to actual quantitative measures. So in the case of crispiness, you might use textural analysis um, to be able to correlate and make sure that your product consistently, uh, from a training purpose, scores in a certain range. But as you know, uh, crispiness off of a machine doesn't necessarily equate to the crispy organoleptic or sensory experience of a consumer. And I, the other thing too that's that's interesting worth noting is that um, you don't have to put your samples at the at the two far ends in the case of I've got some Pringles here on our on our spectrum perhaps you've got a product that you think is even more crispy than Pringles it's just that from a training perspective Pringles are really awesome and very convenient to be able to uh, use repeatedly for the purposes of training your sensory analysis panel so We've trained on a whole pile of different things. And again, that training is going to be unique to the product that you're working on. And you've got to use some creative thinking on figuring out what those training devices are going to be to help people understand what those attributes are. So we're doing some uh, sensory analysis. Yeah, it's a typical sensory setup. I know this this slide has likely got the most, um, the most uh, uh, honorable mentions in this entire <laughs> slide uh, slideshow. But uh, yeah, we're, we're setting up a standard uh, sensory analysis tray with, with coded samples using the three digit codes, providing a cup of water, a spit cup, um, appropriate utensils and palate cleansing as necessary. Now, initially when you're doing training, you may be doing it on an informal basis where you're coaching people in that focus group uh, boardroom setting and you're checking to see that people are scoring consistently by doing a shout out on the board. But more often than not, we're using internet-based software where we are, oh, pardon me, we're, we're using a slider bar uh, to collect those responses. And then it will turn that into numerical data, somewhere in that range of zero to 150 points. And again, that 150 points, it's just the relic of the fact that we used to use paper-based um, paper collection tools 
and we would come along with a pencil and we would we would score on the on the paper base with a pencil and then someone had to sit there with a ruler a 150 millimeter ruler and figure out where you scratched your line and honestly uh, I remember scoring lots of these and we would go googly eyed because you would have to stare at line after line after line with with a paper scoring card the computer has made it so much better um but let's jump in and imagine what does this data analysis look like? I want to talk a bit more about the theory behind that data analysis. So I went back to my peppers here. So what we're doing is we're, we're collecting the data and you can represent it in a histogram type format. But really what we're doing is we're looking at the mean of the response and we're looking at the standard deviation. And I represent that SD down there. The standard deviation is saying if we've got so many responses... What does the spread on that data look like? And how far is it reaching across this curve? If, if people did a really good job and were trained really well, they're going to have a very tight mean and standard deviation. I, I, your, your mean can't be tight, but your standard deviation can be small. And that means that people are consistently scoring in that same mean range and that we're not spreading our, our points all over the map. The area under the curve is important because that is indicative of how many respondents that you had. But in essence, you should have the same number of respondents each time. Now, um, now, what you would be doing is you would look at the mean and the standard deviation on each of your different samples and be able to say, okay, are our means different from one another such that we can confidently say that these samples are the same or these samples are different from one another. And so when you've got really uh, wide standard deviations, then we start to have that data overlapping one another. And, and this, uh, I realize I'm doing this with a hand drawing on, my, on the whiteboard feature on my PowerPoint, but if we imagine those means are the same, now that we have really spread out standard deviations, are we starting to have challenges where those, those data sets are the same or they're different? And I realize that this is a very, dis, uh, very clearly different mean set, but at what point do those samples start to overlap? And while the, the numerical means may be different, because the standard deviations are so large, at what point do those samples no longer be uh, different in terms of the... Um, sensory difference in the population. Now, if we've really trained our groups well, we are going to have very tight, very small standard deviation values. And it's going to be very clear to us when those mean values are different from one another because we will not have a lot of spread in that data. Now, when we're looking at spread on the data, we can be looking at spread on the population. We can also look at spread on um, individuals' responses week over week over week. And so perhaps in the beginning, my individual responses are going to be a little bit all over the map, but with more training, my individual's responses are going to get better over time and my standard deviations are going to decrease. And eventually I will be able to discriminate very, very accurately and represent that on that line scale with good accuracy every single time. And my personal response standard deviation may decrease over time. Now, what does this look like when we start to collect data? Well, we've got, um, quite often it's represented as a radar graph and I, I always joke that we are friends at this point, but I'm gonna just jump. Let, yes, we'll keep our link annotations. And I'm just gonna jump out to my Excel file here. And this is some, um, QDA data that was collected by one of our um, wine sensory analysis classes at Niagara College. And you can see how, let's just blow this up a little bit so we can see from the, from the back of the room. <laughs> I always tease my students at the back of the room. Um, so we converted those numbers into 15 centimeter line scale values. And we had different acidity scores. We had astringency scores. We had viscosity scores. And we had red fruit scores on some wines from uh, Trias Winery in Niagara on the Lake. And then what I did was I took all of that data and I said, well, let's see if we've got um, 
differences between our our samples. And so it would be A, B, C, and D. And what I did was an ANOVA and a Tukey's postdoc. And I have a second slide presentation and second video where I walk through actually doing this statistical analysis. But in this case, A versus B is not this is it is the same. A versus C and A versus D are different. And we can see the significance of that difference here. B versus C is not it's not significantly different. So in essence, uh, the panelists are seeing B sample B and sample C as the same. B versus D is viewed as different. C versus D is viewed as different. So we can go through and see with this ANOVA and Tukey's post hoc which samples are different from one another. We can then also turn it into a histogram. And what's interesting about this histogram is just take a look at the spread. Now, this is this is going to give us an indication of the, the spread on these samples. So blue, we're seeing a very high spread and the, the scores are spreading across almost um, two thirds of the entire spectrum. And so my argument uh, and, and counter response to the team that did this was perhaps you need to have additional training on your samples before you jump into do QDA. And they said, yeah, they just did this as a class project and they only had one week to do it. Oh, no, they actually had two weeks to do it. So they didn't have a lot of training time on their samples. What we can also do is we can turn it into a radar graph. And radar graphs are really um, nice because it allows you to visualize where those mean values are. And so you can see what's happening as you're changing different uh, treatments. And the radar graph is great because you can start to visualize to say, hmm, are my samples uh, drastically different from one another or are they starting to overlap on certain attributes? And the radar graph can help you visualize. And I do have a second video where we're walking through how to do these different analyses. So we'll just jump back to the presentation here and I'll leave you with my classic end of end of the uh, presentation slide. Try it out. Honestly, um, I realize that it's this one's more complicated and this one might be a little bit more difficult to be doing with your friends and family at dinner. But the more you try things and the more you practice your art of doing different things, I realize you may say, well, this is a food science class. This is an art. Well, your art is your performance and your action of doing a skill that you enjoy doing. And in the case of being a food scientist, I would hope you enjoy doing some of these different things and just go out and try it, have some fun. And we'll see you in videos number two and number three as we follow up with uh, some data analysis for this. All right, take care and we'll talk to you again soon.